Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome everyone to our first UM Star Series of the Year. We have with us today Professor Abrizah Abdullah, who is a professor at Department of Library and Information Science, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and also the Dean of Institute of Advanced Studies. Today, um, we are going to talk about a very important topic that relates a lot with um, young researchers, young academics. So I found out about uh, Prof Abriza's work with the Harbingers project and I find it really, really useful to be shared with um, the UM community as a whole because UM is one of the, uh, the, the UM is one of the sample that uh, for, for her research on that. Um, before I go further, I would like to introduce Prof Abriza a little bit. Okay, so the topic today: shaping future ready academic researchers' voices from the research front line. So it's third of March today, and um, we're going to talk about early career researchers um, being the most creative and energetic and the biggest wave of researchers future professors of the country, of the world, and um, none other who's more qualified to talk about this is Professor Abriza Abdullah. Professor Abriza graduated with a bachelor degree in environmental engineering from Temple University, Philadelphia. She obtained her master's and PhD degree both in library and information sciences from UM. You can look at her CV on UM Expert. Extensive, extensive work on library information behavior, scholarly communication, bibliometrics. She is a uh, senior academic associate at Cyber Research Limited UK. Currently, the principal investigator in an international research funded by the Al Alfred Sloan Foundation which investigates the scholarly communication behaviors of early career researchers during the pandemic involving eight countries, that is China, France, Malaysia, Poland, Russia, Spain, the UK and the USA. So that's, I think, mostly the, the, the topic that we're going to discuss today. But other than that, she has uh, contributed a lot in the uh, um, development of Malaysian journal hosting platform MyJournal, which is an a national citation indexing system in 2011, where she was then appointed as the Deputy Director of the Malaysian Citation Centre, MCC, and the advisory panel of the MCC at the Department of Higher Education. She's the Chief Editor of the Malaysian Journal of Library and Information Sciences, which is indexed in both Social Science Citation Index, SSCI, and Scopus. Uh, currently, Prof is a member of Malaysian Open Science Alliance under the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, chairing the Working Group on Capacity Building and Awareness for Malaysian Open Science Platform, MOSP, and a member of the Steering Committee for the International Science Council Project on the Future of Scientific Publishing. So a lot of word future and um, um, early researchers. I think uh, we are looking forward to listen from you, Prof. Uh, currently, Prof is the Dean of the Institute of Advanced Studies, UM. She was the Dean of the Faculty of Computer Science and Information Technology, UM. Prior to this, she served as the Dean of the Institute of Postgraduate Studies, UM, where she and her team were responsible in managing the postgraduate education and ensuring the highest level of full research programs conducted in the university. So there we go. The person with the young researchers at heart researching on this as well. So I would like to um, pass the floor to Prof Abriza for us all to learn from. Silicon Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Azza. That was really, uh, yeah, uh, lengthy, <laughs> but I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, and hopefully, um, uh, my colleagues over there, okay, the viewers can understand uh, the context of research that I'm doing, positioning whatever I have experienced and the positions that I'm at at uh, UM and also at the national level. Uh, so this is something uh, that 
uh, I have vested interest is uh, in studying uh, the scholarly communication behavior of uh, researchers in general, especially researchers coming from research performing organizations uh, such as universities. So I've been doing this since uh, 2013, uh, uh, started from the HIR research, and then I felt that there is a need for us to study deeper into how uh, researchers uh, demonstrate or practice uh, this uh, scholarly communication, not only from publishing, but also how they uh, disseminate their research and in the end, how do they deliver the impact of their research. So in this context, uh, I would like to share okay, with you all uh, how uh, 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 um, uh, uh, for this session, uh, I have a uh, uh, title, okay, my presentation in uh, uh, through this, yeah, shaping future really academic researchers, uh, voice, voices from the research front line, uh, to make sure that this is within uh, what EDEC is doing uh, in terms of developing our academics. All right, so uh, let me take you through this for about an hour. And uh, Dr. Azza, if you have any questions, perhaps that you would like to ask, please uh, do not hesitate to just interrupt me or perhaps if there are questions that you'd like to read out from the chat box, okay, while I'm presenting, yeah. So basically, uh, my present, this is about, you know, I, I would like uh, you to reflect, okay, from the voices that I'm going to share with you, the voices of the early career researchers, I would like the research, uh, the, the viewers to reflect whether you are also uh, practicing this or what is your attitude about this particular topic in early in scholarly communication yeah all right so basically uh, before i proceed i would like just talk a little bit about institute for advanced studies maybe maybe there are among viewers here my colleagues here who have not visited this uh, uh this institute this institute is rather young but it has a long history established in 2018 but again it has a long history okay and that's why uh, we uh, and it was actually envisaged by uh uh, the third vice chancellor of UM, Pak Ngku Aziz, yeah, that the institute would be dedicated for researchers, okay, uh, getting all the researchers from various um, uh, uh, disciplines, be it from science and non sciences, uh, to collaborate, to create opportunities and networking, uh, not only uh, for them to foster their their uh, their career. Uh, and also for them to develop the, their reputation, uh, not only for them, but also for the university and also uh, for the country. Okay, so at present, the institute is especially dedicated to advancement of early career researchers, the professors and laureate of tomorrow that we put in the mural okay, at IAS. All right, so this institute have uh, has um, about 600 uh, uh, masters and uh, a PhD students doing full research, and it is also connecting uh, supervisors from various uh, faculties okay, to supervise uh, uh, these uh, early career researchers. But the early career researchers, they are in a form of uh, doctoral students or full research students here. Okay, so uh, the spotlight of this talk is on ECRs, early career researchers, and uh, they are also known as uh, academic, uh, early career academics, okay, in the context of, you know, uh, depending whether you are looking at uh, uh, in form of uh, teaching, for example, early career academics. But when we talk about early career researchers, uh, these are... Um, these are researchers, okay? They do, uh, they do uh, conduct research, all right? And uh, uh, it's either they are doing research um, uh, in, a, in a research group, yeah? Or they are doing uh, research uh, for an academic degree, or they are also doing research uh, after they have uh, completed their PhD, being a postdoc, or perhaps they are within uh, uh, the first uh, six to 10 years after their doctorate, right? So I will give you the definition of early career researchers later, but while uh, listening to this, I would like you to ask yourself whether you are an early career researcher despite the age, but I'm very sure there are not only early career researchers in this, uh, in this session. I could see that there are also senior researchers uh, hopefully, like what I told Dr. Azza just now, okay, hopefully what we can share here can also be uh, 
you know, something that you can implement or you can practice while connecting uh, to early career researchers. All right, so uh, these are the two objectives of uh, the session. Uh, so in this session, I'm going to provide an annotated topic-based selection uh, of the most insightful comments provided by early career researchers from eight countries when they were asked about their work life and their scholarly communication behavior. So uh, the objective of this session is also to discuss, okay, not, not really to suggest, but to discuss where the action or the concerns or the interest for investment in research development by not only the researchers, but also their institutions or their faculty may lie. <clears throat> All right, these are the learning outcomes. Uh, ADEC wanted me to come up with the learning outcomes. So hopefully at the end of the session or while okay, you are in the session, you'll be able to reflect on your very own scholarly attitudes and behavior okay, in connection or in, in the context of some subtopics of early of scholarly communication and whether uh, your scholarly uh, behaviors, practices, or attitude uh, are changing, okay, whether it, for what reasons are they changing and whether they are changing for your career progression uh, and reputation. Okay, so are you an early career researcher? All right, so early career researchers, uh, we, uh, various literature has said that this is really a community of strategic interests. Uh, uh, they, they have to be uh, future ready, meaning that they have to be proactive. When we talk about future ready, you need to be proactive. Uh, you need to, to create a better future for yourself. Okay, so early career researchers, they need to create a better future for themselves, especially in the context of getting, uh, you know, a, a, a secured uh, a job. Okay, job security is very important for them and they have to be um, uh, future ready, being proactive, create a better future for them, all right, through their research, through their research, through knowledge exchange, uh, maybe through doing outreach engagement, volunteering and also a partnership collaboration, all right. So uh, these early career research researchers, there are many of them. Right. We do not know how many of them in Malaysia, but indeed they are many, okay, and they merit serious attention and also research. All right. So uh, on that basis, uh, the Habija research team uh, came together, right? Uh, uh, we are basic, we are from various universities uh, 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 in, in eight countries. Uh, and uh, uh, we collaborate uh, through uh, cyber research. Okay, cyber research is is a research organization based in UK uh, that uh, are very interested in researching scholarly communication behavior, uh, also including uh, publishing, uh, research and publishing. Right. So uh, um, you you can uh, go to you can Google cyber research or Habinger research, and you can get access to all the reports. Uh, that are there and also our, you know, uh, research materials, papers, um, uh, our data there, our code books and also the survey, uh, sorry, uh, the, the interview protocol, they are all there. Yeah, so you can get access to know uh, uh, to the resources there uh, if you are interested to know more about the research, right? Or perhaps uh, we like to replicate this research, okay, in the context of your own very discipline. For example, you might want to uh, you know, uh, investigate early career researchers in in uh, in uh, medical sciences, for example. So you 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 will be able to replicate this if you're interested. All right. So this project is funded by first publishing research consortium publisher. So the first funder was a publisher, all right, uh, uh, based in uh, in the UK, and uh, the second uh, uh, funder is Alfred Sloan Foundation. Uh, the recent uh, uh, based. Uh, uh, and the research that and the findings that I'm going to share with you is based on uh, the the research uh, funded by Alfred Sloan um, that we started in 2020. All right, so basically this is the background of the research, and Dr. Azar also has uh, uh, you know uh, uh, briefly indicated this uh, just now. Yeah. All right, so we are. We look into whether the new wave of researchers are going to change things. Okay, what are the things that they are going to change in the future, right? Being future researchers, future professors, 
uh, or will they simply end up towing the line, meaning that they just get, will they just be getting directives or doing what has been done by their senior researchers, for example. So this is uh, the base of, of the research, uh, whether we want, whether the early career researchers, uh, you know, are changing or not, are transforming or not, all right? Uh, uh, looking at uh, that, they are actually digital natives, okay? Our early career researchers now, they are actually digital natives. They are about, maybe, maybe, Based, based on my research, some of them, they are up to 40 years old, 40 years old, right? Some of them, they are not really, uh, uh, really uh, young, yeah? Uh, but the majority of them, they are between um, 30 uh, to 30, 36, 37 years old, yeah? However, they have not achieved or not having an established position or not being confirmed or not having a tenure position. All right. Okay. In the context of uh, uh, their work life. Okay. So basically, this is how we define early career researchers um, before we started data collection. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we define them by years since completing PhD, typically 10 years. So uh, the working definition is uh, researchers generally not older than 35. This is when we started the project uh, in 2016. Yeah, They are not in established or tenured positions, right? Some of them, they get, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the context of Malaysia, they might get a contract, okay, but, uh, or, or they may be, uh, 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 a permanent post, uh, but it is not confirmed, not not at the stage where they are confirmed okay, as, as an academic. Okay, so when we proceeded further, um, <clears throat> In uh, the second project, in Harbages 2, when we collected the data, these researchers are not older than 45. You can actually see the gap there. Okay, Those who are actually coming to be early career researchers and more early career researchers wants to be early career researchers. And there are actually a big you know, gap between uh, the first time when we collected the data. They are not older than 45, uh, 35, but in Habiges 2, they are generally not older than 45. And at that age also, they are still current, they are still doing their doctorate and they are not in established or tenured positions, right? And some of them, they are working in universities. Okay, so basically, uh, this talks about how we collect the data, and I would like to, uh, you know, let you know that it is a prolonged engagement for uh, for about uh, two years, uh, uh, with three repeated uh, interviews. Yeah, and each interview um, lasts about hundred and twenty minutes. Right, and the interviews were held at uh, six monthly intervals. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, the interviews were also supplemented and triangulated by uh, the participants' uh, CV and also desk research about the participants and their, their digital footprints. All right. So, what we had was really wonderful a mountain of data obtained in the interview. Uh, but, and this is what I'm going to share with you all. Uh, okay, you can uh, read more about uh, uh, the methodology uh, uh, in the various documents that we share on uh, Habiges website. So basically what we did was asking them uh, 18 broad scholarly topics. Okay, but before that, with, but we started with uh, the without the pandemic in the foreground, but later on we interviewed the second and the third round. Okay, uh, pandemic stress and anxiety really, uh, uh, you know, come out during the interview. But basically, the uh, the topics are related to uh, job security, career progression, uh, mentoring, whether they need mentoring or still 
being mentored or not, how are they being assessed, whether they do collaborate, to what extent are they collaborating, how do they search for finding information, uh, publication or research ethics, yeah, uh, networking, for example, um, um, uh, how do they go about sharing their information, informal communication, for example, uh, whether they are doing the emerging uh, scholarly practices, for example, sharing through preprint servers, whether they are doing outreach and engagement with the colleagues or outside or beyond academia, and whether uh, and what are the scholarly transformation that they foresee will happen okay, in the future, all right, in the next five years, for example. All right. So what I would like to what I feel worth mentioning here is that uh, the cohort of ECRs from Malaysia, they are they are experienced. Yeah, they are experienced early career researchers. They are not naive. They want to change. Okay, and uh, they they really demonstrate that uh, they are the research workhorses. They do a lot of things. Okay, uh, in their research group, and they often publish. Right. And uh, and they also help to lead a research project. And some of them, even at the early career stage, okay, they are also supervising uh, PhD students. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. So uh, before I go uh, to the various voices, I would like to just summarize uh, and characterize. Uh, uh, the impact uh, of uh, the pandemic yeah, uh, to uh, the early career researchers. Uh, so this is what we sum up. Yeah, You can see there are actually commonality among countries, all right? China, France, Malaysia, resilient. And for Malaysia, not only resilient generation, but they are also resourceful. Okay. Uh, well, this you you have to treat these findings or this uh, su uh, this uh, this uh, summary uh, 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 in caution, yeah, because uh, there are there are one hundred and seventy seven early career researchers represented in this research. All right, which about twenty to twenty five ECRs from various countries. Yeah. Uh, so these are actually summed up by the principal investigator of the particular country and also validated uh, by the other uh, principal invest by our own uh, group in uh, PI yeah, from various countries. All right. So for Malaysia, uh, I put the word okay and agreed by the other PIs that they are actually resourceful. Panjang akal. Okay. If they have, you know, if they are stuck in a particular aspect, okay, they know how to go about finding help, finding support, and handle the particular issue, for example. Uh, for example, in terms of, you know, uh, if there are issues about them, cannot be a corresponding author, yeah, because of certain agreement uh, or authorship policy with their research group, where they would like to be the corresponding author, uh, and they contribute a lot and eligible to, the co be, to be the corresponding author, but they could not, uh, but they would they are able actually to negotiate and find ways okay, to address that particular issues. In terms of United Kingdom, UK, okay, it is a disappointed generation, all right, with the pandemic sowing the seeds of disappointment. This is this is being described by the PI. Okay. Uh, you can, if you want to, if you are interested, you can read more about, about the finding. Um, uh, uh, from this paper, okay. What I, whatever I highlighted, uh, 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 read. For example, I highlighted read here early career researchers. Okay, this is the title of the paper uh, that summarized, okay, and characterized the impact of early career researchers. All right, so you can find the paper online. All right. So in terms of Malaysian ECRs that reflect changes in attitudes and practices, okay. Uh, yeah, remote work to become the norm for them. All right. Okay, so uh, they, they told us that uh, is, Malaysian ECR said that they are built to handle stress. They have been, they have proven that they are built to handle stress. They have coping mechanisms and they are resourceful. Yeah, okay, uh, you can read this. And also, um, yeah, they feel that there are very little signs of scientific research being significantly disrupted. Okay, those, are, those uh, research that are being disrupted are research that, you know, uh, that, 
involve them, uh, uh, involve lab work. Uh, okay, those research that involve lab work were really affected. All right, but for most of them, working from home uh, have uh, working from home has made uh, their 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 research or scholarly scholarly behavior easier. For example, uh, they were able to work on research grant working from home. They were able to to write their thesis, focus re write, uh, writing, for example, and also they will a be able to uh, do peer review and publish in the articles. Right. Uh, and also for uh, Malaysian ECRs, even for the postdoc and doctoral students, they would like to go into academia. Okay, other jobs, you know, uh, they, they 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 are not open to other uh, different career paths. Uh, they feel that uh, being in academia is uh, having a job in academia. Uh, uh, is, uh, uh, leads to job security. Uh, and one thing, uh, well, I believe this is something that most of us agree uh, that. Uh, they, they, they really hero worship in for uh, IF, uh, you know, uh, impact factor uh, journals. Yeah, uh, their views of the impact factor journals as the gold standard have not changed, and they said that this does not change because they need to achieve their KPI. For 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 doctoral students, yes, that they, they say that this is the requirement for them uh, to graduate. Yeah, all right. So basically, these are the are the, the attitudes and practices that uh, are not changed up to uh, when when we started up to the third interview okay uh, the the changes uh, there's no changes in attitudes and practices for them all right uh, however uh, when we look at the various uh, you know uh, interview data what actually uh, would be a possible permanent change would be uh, first in terms of using online platform and digital tools, right? Um, yeah, they do feel connected. Although, although um, uh, they are using, they are working, uh, you know, uh, 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 collaborating, uh, 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 discussing using uh, this digital platform, right? Uh, using uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, using Webex, Zoom. They do feel connected. It is not like the senior researchers who feel that you know, uh, meeting online meetings are really tiresome and all that. But to them, uh, this would be the future. Okay, uh, working remotely continues and become the norm uh, for early career researchers. They are happy uh, working uh, remotely. Right, they are also very versatile in terms. Those who teach, okay, they are also very versatile. Yeah. Um, and uh, and also um, yeah, they feel that it is okay. Yes, but they also uh, it is okay with conferences, uh, hybrid conferences. But they do feel that uh, you know the shift to online uh, conferences uh, save time. Yeah, they do feel that uh, if there are hybrid conferences, they would prefer uh, to attend uh, the online one because as a rule, uh, they are not given uh, travel related expenses because uh, of their contract status yeah? these are for academics yeah? okay so uh, uh, they felt that it is very competitive nowadays okay to make themselves visible or build rep reputation uh, uh, early based on their publications because their publications are not that enough for them uh, to garner h index or to garner citations so what they do is that they actively uh, self-brand themselves they, they develop their reputation uh, through social media platform yeah especially linkedin they do connect with the industry for example and some of them even say that they manage to get phd students for example uh, through building their online narrative adding their publications in linkedin so this is something that uh, we can actually, you know, uh, perhaps learn uh, from early career researchers that they do feel that they have, uh, you know, they, they, they do have their own visibility and start developing reputation on uh, LinkedIn. All right. However, okay, this is universally exhibited. This is the findings from various countries, but not for Malaysia. Okay. Preprint servers will be here to stay. This is what the researchers from other countries said, but not Malaysia. Malaysia does not tell say much, okay, about preprint servers. Some of them have never, in fact, uh, tried out preprint server. Yeah, 
and also uh, reaching out, uh, doing outreach and engagement uh, to people beyond academia. Uh, so this is not also being exhibited by uh, Malaysian ECRs uh, because uh, there is not there is no a requirement for them to do so, except for those who have, uh, you know, a research grant uh, that uh, that that mandate them to uh, to reach out to a particular uh, stakeholder, for example, uh, you know, uh, collaborating with the industry or also communicating to the public. But in general, early career researchers uh, uh, in in, uh, the, in uh, this cohort uh, that I interviewed, they are not doing outreach uh, and engagement, not yet. Okay, so more voices from uh, the early career researchers that I'm going to share based on topics. Okay, first of all, uh, the new norm, uh, the new normal is virtual to them. Yeah, so you, you can actually look at some of the narratives, uh, the verbatim uh, statements that I extracted from, uh, from the data that we have. Uh, the red ones are, that I highlighted in the next few slides are from Malaysia. For example, we are somewhat better at operating in the virtual world than our seniors, uh, being a digital native. Uh, Okay, on research performance, okay, most of them, all right, uh, they don't believe uh, assessing uh, research performance based on metrics. Okay, you can actually see here for Malaysia, frustration with an evaluation system that plays too much emphasis on numbers. Metrics are un unappreciated, meaning that the ECRs, they do not appreciate metrics, not yet. Well, yeah, I, I do believe not not to not yet because they have not developed that. They have not gone to developing or garnered citations or establishing a good H index. Okay. All right. You see, and alternative so to citations, LinkedIn. Uh, so the early one one voice from early career researchers here. This is uh, somebody in, I believe, a business, eh? LinkedIn, people that discuss your work immediately after it is published. CEOs and CTOs also discuss it too. Yeah. So these are the what we, we learn from them, right? Okay, so you can actually see simil similar voices are being, uh, you know, reflected uh, from Spain, Russia, uh, and also UK. All right, uh, scholarly communication systems. Okay, these are all the, uh, the voices from um, uh, the international voices, yeah? that somehow uh, does not believe, okay, in uh, the present scholarly uh, system, that is the publishing system, all right? Because the system uh, focused too much on uh, a commercialization, yeah? And also, um, and also metrics again. For example, you can actually see here the second bullet, eh? Uh, the journal-centric elitist system. So that is the journal-centric elitist system is basically the theme, all right? And it is related to impact factors. Impact factors controls our lives, all right? In fact, in France, okay, there has been a breakdown between junior and senior researchers. Right? The vision of where do they publish, their careers do not converge anymore, okay? All right? So ECRs, they said that they really have to go fast. They want to secure the job, okay? However, the seniors, uh, they are uh, too slow. So there are actually a generation, uh, you know, breakdown between these two. In fact, uh, last week, uh, when uh, an editor-in-chief of a, a, you know, a, 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 a very, uh, you know, um, popular journal uh, in my research area uh, came and visit me, she also mentioned that that is actually a gap between the senior and the junior researchers uh, in our research discipline. Yeah, because um, the early career researchers uh, they tend to you know be very more strategic in in publishing. Right, they 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 venture out and yeah? they venture out. They are more collaborative and they are they they go into uh, cross disciplinary uh, research at an early stage compared to uh, uh, the senior ones. All right, so these are the voices from Malaysia about the scholarly uh, system, scholarly publishing. 
right? Like what I told you earlier, uh, the view uh, of uh, impact factor journals at the gold standard has not changed. But however, they do it because they need to achieve the KPI, all right? Unlike researchers from other countries, uh, sorry, sorry, unlike, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, the senior researchers or maybe the uh, most senior researchers, they will say, that, okay, they publish because of science and all that, right? <laughs> to advance science. That's the ideal thing. You publish because you want to share, because you want to advance science. But in reality, can you publish because the need for you to achieve your KPI? So these are the voices coming from Malaysia. Okay, I, I'm going to read one more. I think this is uh, interesting to me. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Journals are still the most credible sources you can find for research because of the rigorous peer review process. But I think people publish in journals because of the wrong reason to achieve KPI. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you can read this. Okay. All right. This is just to share with you. Uh, when we talk about the factors involved in selecting a journal, you can actually see this is coming from Malaysia and Poland. And the first one eh, that I highlighted in red. Malaysian and Poland ECRs prioritize to publish in WAS or Scopus Index journals and because they are told to do so. So when we ask them, okay, which is the first choice? Okay, they always talk about WAS and Scopus. But for researchers in other countries, they go for appropriate audience. They go for relevant to the field. Okay, some of them even go for open access. All right. Some of them go for journals that are trusted in my field, something like that. Yeah. OK. But the high priority given uh, to index uh, in wars or Scopus journals coming from Malaysia and Poland because that has been mandated by their research institution. So it has become a policy. Yeah. OK. Transformation. When we talk about transformation in the scholarly system, uh, well, these are the voices. All right, I would like to highlight one here that Malaysia ECR says that they are not in a position to ring in change. So when we talk about them, okay, how, what, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, what action are you going to take to transform these things? You're not satisfied with this. How are you going to do it and all that? So they always say that, okay, we are just small fish. And it can, it can be this. We cannot say anything. Our voices are not being heard. Even during the pandemic, okay, we are still being assessed and rewarded similarly before, right? Zombie or pandemic things will not change. So these are the things that coming out from them, right? Okay, so they hope for other types of publication to be recognized also by the institution. Some of them said that, okay, this is coming from social sciences, yeah? By the way, the ECRs in this study are coming from only science and social sciences ECRs, not arts and humanities, eh? they are not uh, included, okay? I wish my university will still consider creative writing on suitable platforms, not necessarily books. I'm a strong advocate for conference being treated the same as journal publication. Recognizing conference in our KPI, please. Okay, this person says that there are so many prestigious conference and conferences, conferences in his discipline. Okay, this is in computing. Yeah, that are actually comparable to a WAS index journal, but somehow these conferences uh, are not uh, giving uh, you know a uh, uh, merited or enough merit. Okay, as uh, or the same as journal publication. And another said, we have been trained to write in journals. We need to be trained as well to publish in other inform informal channels. We can actually see now uh, the, uh, the young researchers are starting to block, block scholarly, scholarly blocks, but we have not yet seen this, okay, among uh, early career researchers, eh? okay, because uh, scholarly blogging, uh, uh, it is not uh, considered, it is not expected, okay, of of our uh, uh, researchers. It is not an expectation to, of our early career researchers. Okay, open access publishing. Yes, they feel that open access publishing help careers. Yeah, okay. So this is what an early career researcher say from Malaysia. My current generation would be looking to something that can be published faster, earlier, passing the paywall. Okay, so in, in many cases, this uh, type of OA publishing uh, requires uh, an APC, all right? Yeah, so this is an issue for them, huh? you see? The, th the fourth bullet, 
open access is expensive. They charge us like crazy for the hard work that we do. Okay, USD 1000 APC. All right. So these are the what they, they lamented. Yeah. Okay. And they also wish for more affordable open access. Okay. For example, I'm hoping for a more affordable publishing platform for both authors and readers, a kinder reception to our own open access national and regional ASEAN journals. All right. Okay. Create high status for these journals, especially those coming from universities. There are many good ones, but not indexed in Scopus, meaning that this particular early career researchers feels that journals belonging to the scientific community, journals that are published by universities, although has not reached an indexation status, but they should be berated. They should be, when, when we talk about this in my discipline, in LIS, when we talk about this, uh, we, we call it diamond journal, meaning that diamond journals are journals that belongs to the scientific community. Scientific community take care of the journal, okay? Peer reviewing, editing, publishing, all right? So these are the diamond journals. So yes, the early career researchers in this sense uh, hope for uh, diamond journals to also be uh, given uh, merits. All right, so that is for open access publishing. Azza, can I go on, Azza, Dr. Azza? Please, research. Please, please, ah, okay. Please. All right, I think I can finish this in another 15 minutes, yeah? Okay. So research ethics, let's take a look at research ethics, yeah? Okay, when we talk about research ethics, then you know that, okay, uh, yeah, we, we do see that most of these comments on research ethics coming from China, a lot coming from China, uh, not much coming from UK and US, yeah? Uh, but when we talk about Mal Malaysian ECRs, okay, they are, when, when we ask them, okay, do you know about anything not, uh, you know, uh, do you think any, any, anything uh, that is problematic or not ethical happen in your own disciplines and all that? It has always been related to authorship. Yeah, I can actually see this is the main theme, okay? Ethics and integrity is more on authorship. That matters, uh, on authorship matters for Malaysia. These are the two verbal teams that I got that I can share. When the paper is completed, everyone wants to be corresponding. How do I handle that? <laughs> and it has to start from day one. This is from Medic. Eh? Anyone, everyone has to be clear of their roles and who are in the paper so that they will know how much weightage they will bring. Yeah. Okay. So these are some examples. Eh? Okay. All right, and then about communicating, maintaining contact with peers. Uh, this is not difficult for them. Okay, they do make informal communication, especially with peers, not with superiors, with their uh, peers, eh? okay, with the other early career researchers. Right? Okay, networking, collaboration, virtual meeting, conferences, they prefer online. Per I'm not sure, maybe if we do a follow up study with them, perhaps they. Yeah, I'm not sure whether th this is going to be or it has not changed or has it changed to hybrid, for example, or has it changed to uh, to uh, to face to face, for example. But uh, but uh, the sentiment is that they would like okay to go for a networking collaboration virtually. Yeah. Okay. All right. In Poland, uh, uh, the PI uh, wrote that wrote this, yeah? traveling to or for work is becoming an endangered activity for many ECRs. Right? Some ECRs are very cautious about traveling. Yeah? Uh, online tools are enough here. Yeah? I, all right? I, I would like to leave them. I would not, not leave them and not go anywhere, everywhere anymore. Okay, sometimes two or four days were lost. So this, even now also, um, my colleague, okay, in Poland and also in Spain saying that uh, uh, most conferences are still uh, doing a hybrid and uh, the younger ones would prefer to do it uh, online. Okay, social media, uh, yeah, social media is uh, interesting in the context of Malaysia because uh, our ECRs have started uh, going to the social web okay to develop uh, to to reach out all right uh, uh to the public okay uh, i was actually a bit surprised because when we first in the in the first interview uh nobody nobody mentioned tiktok <laughs> but in the third interview yes yeah i think this has something to do with the pandemic as well all right so this particular researcher if you look at the second last bullet use tiktok for visibility and share my research 
and feels that it is a very powerful tool instead of waiting for seminar to say something, all right? Okay. Researchers are becoming social butterflies, all right? However, in the context of Malaysian ECRs, not many of them actually are, you, are, are using Twitter to disseminate their research or sharing their ideas. They are consumer of Twitter, but they, they do not create okay, uh, content for Twitter. This is what I noticed for Malaysian ECRs, right? So this is something very interesting that I, I, I think that I would like to share. One particular ECR said, whenever my article got accepted, I used pop relief to blast my current research on social media. So he came up with an acronym, pop relief, yeah, pop relief, which stands for Pablon, Orchid, so Google Scholar, Research Gate, UM Expert, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Right? You see yeah, how, how, how these digital natives are really using um, uh, these uh, digital tools eh, to to uh, to develop uh, for visibility and uh, in the hope of uh, you know strengthen their reputation. Okay, peer review is a bit problematic, all right? Uh, and I believe uh, my colleagues, uh, the viewers here, also find this is becoming a problem uh, because people are now not willing to peer review. Yeah, okay. Spain said on the verge of collapse. All right. UK said if you want to get more reviewers, you need to incentivize the reviewers. Even among our Malaysian ECRs, they say that peer review should be incentivized. Okay. Peer reviewing activities are not emphasized in our KPI. Yeah, okay. That's what they said. All right. Okay. University should support this by including this activity in research assessment. University will also have data on how many of the academics contribute to science through peer review. This is very clever. Okay, so about peer review, right? So this is what uh, is actually happening if, uh, yeah, the need for them to, uh, uh, to, for peer review to be also merited. Yeah, okay. So if you notice that uh, most of the, the, uh, uh, the verbatims coming from Malaysian researchers are in relation to KPI. So that's why we already discussed with the with, when I discussed with the other uh, the other uh, uh, principal investigators. Okay, uh, the comment they made that uh, we have expectations, but uh, you have KPIs. <laughs> this is what the in the end our, our discussion lead to to this uh, to this uh, conclusion that other countries have expectations for their for their early career researchers but malaysia has kpi okay preprints yes preprints are uh early career researchers malaysians they are not really uh you know verbose or, or perhaps uh, articulate in talking about preprints uh, because uh not not many of them. In fact, only uh, one or two of them have experience submitting preprints or peer reviewing preprints. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so one Malaysian said to be considered a publication if rewarded. Preprints must be considered as a publication. It should be rewarded. Okay. So submit preprint only when it is recognized. To submit or not, it goes back to the reward system. Then again, it is KPI. I would say preprint should be considered as a form of publication and receive rewards for it. Right in other countries, preprints is considered okay to be a publication, but not in Malaysia. But somehow uh, there are also uh, early career researchers who are not have, who have not experienced or not comfortable with preprints because they only go for uh, they only uh, read uh, or use uh, papers that have been peer reviewed. Yeah. Okay. So that's why you uh, you you might know that uh, there are actually prestigious preprint servers such as uh, archive.org, chem archive, uh, bio archive that are now being indexed by Scopus. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, 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 the future is going towards recognizing preprints uh, as well and going to be normalized by scientists. This is what the world, the world is heading. So outreach again, okay, they are doing it. Yeah, they are doing it. All right, but not many of them are doing it uh, on uh, for, for Malaysia. Yeah, even if they are doing it, they are still doing uh, uh, outreach uh, through uh, social media platform. They they do not go out and give talk to the to the industry, for example, uh, to the public, for example, uh, you know, or, or to the other research community. 
all right uh because they are not expected to do so and many of them say that uh going outreach and engagement are only expected by those who are seniors who are more experienced okay uh so at their uh, level as early career researchers they feel that uh, this outreach and engagement uh uh, talking to the industry, for example, talking to, to the policy makers, for example, uh, belong to the more uh, senior researchers. <clears throat> so access to information and libraries, uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, when we talk about uh, access to information on libraries, uh, they will talk about their smartphones, uh, smartphone apps, yeah. Uh, and, and one relation says that smart phone apps upsurping the role of the library, highly used researcher app, for example. Uh, and uh, yes, some of them, in fact, many of them, they use shadow libraries. Okay, they use SciHub. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, they will always check on SciHub uh, whether they have access or not. All right. So they only do it if it is really, really urgent. Yeah. Uh, and there is a sentiment saying that academic libraries are no longer useful for researchers and they go only uh, they go to academic libraries only to search for uh, only to, to search for papers. And if libraries are not subscribing to journals anymore, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, the, the libraries are not being used. Okay, They do not uh, patronize the library anymore physically. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there are also things that I would like to highlight here in terms of predatory publishing. But for this particular aspect, uh, we highlight this in the form of a paper that is in, uh, in press, and the dog that did not bark, predatory journals and clear and early career researchers. One thing that is, I would say, that is encouraging from this research is that early career researchers, these early career researchers are... Uh, uh, they volunteer to participate in this research. Okay, they volunteer. All right, uh, because of I mean we have a, a, a list of criteria and they volunteer. So when we blast the the email to them, uh, to the universities, they wrote us, they wrote to us back and said that they want to uh, to participate in this research, and. Most of these early career researchers are very interested in the topic. Not only interested in the topic, but also they are they are productive. Okay, so for this, for we can actually see uh, early career researchers that that are productive, that have started to publish in legitimate journals. They predatory journal is not a major concern of them any, right? When we talk about predatory journal, they they what what is it? They appear not not even to talk uh, to us about this, all right? Because they are not doing it and and. Yeah, they, 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 they feel that that is not necessary for you to, to, to ask us about these predatory journals because we are not doing it. We are not doing it. We only, we are very strategic out with our publishing practices and well, this is not even in our, uh, in our dictionary. So they do not know uh, about predatory journals. It is not a concern about them. Not a concern uh, for them. Okay, uh, in terms of to what extent uh, the scholarly communication system is seen to be broken uh, or not work uh, effectively for the early, early, early career researchers, most of them says about the assessment. Most of them, yeah, okay. Uh, they, they feel that the, assessments, uh, the assessment of research or research assessment should be reformed. All right, for example, this coming from Malaysia. Malaysia does not see a broken, but one that needs reform, especially in regard to the overvaluation of research output, which is to the detriment of science. Right? Okay, you can actually see from Russia, same. Broken scholarly system, largely because of the focus on metrics and proxies. I know, some questionable behavior. Okay, all right. Spain, although Spain says that it is not a broken system, but it is a system that is too influenced by assessment criteria. Okay, Spain says peer review needs improving. Okay, all right. Again, UK, not a broken system, but then again commented. Yeah, again with how reputation is being measured. But the US system is doing nicely, peer review needs reforming and obtains all the attentions. So only US did not comment about uh, research assessment. Yeah. Okay. One thing that I noticed, uh, uh, US, uh, the research assessment is very much based on DORA. 
All right. So the universities in the United States and many universities in the UK, uh, they adhere to the declaration of research assessment. That is, uh, you can actually look at DORA. Uh, when I mentioned DORA uh, to our early career researchers, have you heard of DORA? They, none of them uh, have said that they have heard of DORA. Right. So you can if you would like to, uh, you know, uh, if you're interested and you want you want to read more about declaration of research assessment, uh, you can Google DORA and uh, the US system is uh, really adhering to DORA. OK, uh, that matrix should be treated with caution right? and it should not be the sole, uh, you know, indicator uh, that should that is used for research assessment. <coughs> Okay, I'm thinking out loud for Malaysia. This is just a conclusion, but I want to think uh, out loud for Malaysia. Yeah, it, for Malaysia, change occur everywhere in various activities. For example, collaboration uh, very fast. Uh, the early career researchers they collaborate really fast. Some of them they go collaborating. Uh, uh, you know, during the first interview, um, started collaborating international. And the third interview started collaborating beyond academia, start, start to collaborate with industry, publishing together with industry, right? But in some areas, for Malaysia, it is very, very slow. For example, preprint, no takers, not, not many takers. Um, some, uh, some activities are easily uh, changed, for example, uh, 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 publishing, all right? Uh, but others are more fixed okay for example metrics they have not been changed in terms of using uh, citations or going for impact factor journals uh, for publishing for example okay um what i would like to uh, highlight here that uh there is um uh, you know uh, very very clear uh, uh in respect to the early career researchers' interest towards uh, collaboration and online communities. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe I, I was thinking of doing a research on uh, uh, comparing uh, international collaboration between early career, uh, okay, among early career researchers and the more senior ones who are more international, internationally collaborative. Perhaps somebody can, <laughs> if you're interested, you can do a bibliometric study on that. Um, okay, so what, what, I would like to uh, share here that when you look at the situation, uh, look at the voices uh, that I have shared, eh, the picture is not only uh, uh, granular and very personal. Some of them are really personal, eh, the, the voices that they hear. But you can actually see, uh, although it is personal, you can actually see the siblings of potential change, right? Uh, but uh, you can, you can, we, we can actually see that there will be, uh, yeah, that things will change in different directions, for example. If we uh, go back to them and ask them again, uh, you know, uh, uh, on how they would like uh, certain scholarly communication practices uh, being transformed, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, uh, you, you, we, we cannot generalize the finding definitely because this is a qualitative research, uh, and we have read, and something that we can do is actually to do a survey, okay, to to confirm uh, whether things are changing, what what things are going to change, what are things that they would like to see change, uh, whether they are actually uh, looking forward towards transformation or what kind of transformation they would like to see, perhaps so. We, we, we can do this, okay, in a form of a survey to confirm that for, for Malaysian ECRs. <clears throat> okay, so what I would like to advocate here is that faculty and policymakers would be advised to wake up to what ECRs told us. There is no intention, actually, when we, when we did, when we did this research, we, we were actually looking at the implication on the publishing, publish, public, publishing side, the scholarly publishing sites, the implication to to journals, uh, to, to, journal, to journal publishers, the implications to readers, the implications to policymakers or funders. Um, policymakers is not really policymakers at the university, but policymakers at the, at, at the national level. So we do feel that, I, in fact, I do feel that whatever stories or voices coming from uh, the ECRs here uh, should be taken consideration also by, 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 by the faculty, by, by, by faculty meaning that uh, by their, their colleagues at the faculty, by the more senior researchers, for example, right? Uh, after all, these early career researchers represent the biggest group of researchers and they are on the research front line, 
right? They they really uh, we should consider whatever scholarly communication activities that they do. Okay, they have not reached to the status that they are like the senior researchers, but they are also doing uh, activities uh, that are similar to the uh, senior researchers. So for example, this is something that I would like to highlight uh, because I'm very much into uh, doing this for, for Malaysian Open Science uh, Platform eh? uh, for, for MOSP. Uh, for example, the changes towards transparency and openness in publishing, all right? Uh, so early career researchers, they are towards uh, data sharing, they are towards publishing, um, although they are not into preprints, they know, but they are not into preprints because it is not being recognized, right? But they are quite, uh, you know, after after two years, they are quite, uh, you know, uh, yeah, they, 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 they understand the scholarly communication system and the need to move towards transparency and openness for publishing to foster ethics and integrity, to foster responsible, responsible, reproducible research. So many of them have started to say that, yes, we are going to share our data. Data sharing is, uh, is, is imminent, for example. All right? We have started to include a data availability statement in our papers, for example. We have started to share whatever supplementary materials that we have, not only the papers, but also the program codes, uh, and, and some of them, they do say that if they have code books, they are going to share as well okay, in repositories, not, not at the publisher platform. Okay? So are they, they, are, they, they have the potential to be, uh, uh, to be conducting open peer review, having open identities and open report. They are positive about this, but they are not doing it yet okay, because it has not been, they are not expected to do it. It's not in their their KPI. That again, it relates to the to the KPI. Yeah, but they are really towards uh, uh, top or transparency and openness in publishing. The the, the thought is there. Okay, so um, just a little bit uh, to share about openness and transparency. If uh, the institution or the university is really uh, uh, you know a uh, going towards uh, openness and transparency or open science or open scholarship, then these are the 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 must the must do things that they they should uh, be doing yeah so they have to mandate affordable open access science right open science uh, technical support advisory service for example a dedicated unit okay to look at uh, APC for example uh, create incentive for um, uh, uh, for openness yeah push for open data sharing. Incentivize people who share, uh, you know, uh, who, who, who share data, for example, all right? Uh, yes, we are now going to develop an open site infrastructure. University Malaya is going to have its own data repository. And uh, yes, university should also be uh, supporting uh, practicing open scholarly communication. But towards that is affordable, okay, to, the common, to our, our own uh, research community. All right, so I have here four essential qualities that will define the future researchers to create tomorrow's change makers. So these are all being, you know, reflected in uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the interview data. Um, so early career researchers, or not really early career researchers, but all researchers should advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. All right, no one should be left behind. Yeah. Okay. So these are actually being incorporated uh, in uh, openness and transparency and having journals. You know, if, if that is going to happen, if you if early career researchers or even you as uh, as researchers advocate for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, so you must also, for example, as as a journal editor or publisher, you should also uh, you know provide uh, 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 a way. Okay. Uh, for for you to be more friendly towards early career researchers so you you can have a section on uh, a, 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 a section or a, a, a collection of papers that coming from early career researchers so you know all these things are being uh, thought about by by publishers by editors uh, to make uh, journals more uh, diversified okay equitable and also inclusive yeah research communication is very important all right uh, uh, well, uh, uh, now 
we we yeah edek edek please uh, maybe edek can come up with a uh, with with a, a workshop on yeah with a talk or perhaps training on research communication this is important uh yeah resilient like what i said here we for malaysian early career researchers and also for the other uh you know countries uh, they describe uh, the early career researchers as as resilience and also collaboration so these are the four qualities that will define the future researchers the, and, and the future is now, okay? Uh, yeah, advocacy for DI, research communication, resilience, collaboration. And how do you, uh, uh, you know, apply this in whatever you do matters? For example, you as a journal editor, you as a reviewer, for example, you as a, as a mentor, yeah? Uh, you, of course, as early career researchers, uh, you as a dean, for example, right? Uh, uh, need to incorporate this, all right? Uh, in whatever capacity uh, that you are doing now uh, to create uh, tomorrow's uh, proof, uh, 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 future proof uh, early career researchers. Okay, so um, these are the must, skill, must have skills for researchers and we learn this from the early career researchers who have actually been practicing this very much early. Right. Okay. For research competencies to support open scholarship, evidence-based research information. This is very important. Early career researchers have started to compile the evidence-based research information and make this public through Pablon, for example. Okay. Uh, through through LinkedIn, delivering research impact. Mm. All right. They do not deliver. They have started to deliver their research impact, although although it is not in a form of a scientific. Uh, impact like H index or citations. Eh? Digital research skills. Okay. All right. So when, when we started, we, that, there was nothing to, nothing mentioned about chat GPT or AI. Yeah. But uh, definitely if we ask them now, <laughs> our early career researchers, I, I, be, I do believe that they have actually, you know, been uh, using using uh, AI okay, in their research. But we, we, yeah, we did not ask them. It, it, did not come into the picture to ask them about the use of uh, AI okay, in, in them doing research, for example. All right, invisible colleges and beyond. It should be cross-disciplinary. Yes, early career researchers are doing invisible colleges, but they do not do it face-to-face. -face. Yeah, okay, all right. International collaboration. Collaboration beyond academia, yeah. Collaboration beyond academia and international collaboration, it has its own merit when we talk about research assessment. All right. So, uh, yeah, I, I, do, I do believe that this is going to be it in the future when assess research assessment is done uh, not only by number of publications, but also to show, to show impact. Okay, to show how do you deliver your impact, uh, you need to have international collaborators uh, and also... Uh, yeah, uh, policymakers or perhaps uh, industry uh, or, or even the citizen science in your papers. Yeah. Okay, so for outreach and engagement, research communications or science communication, uh, yeah, I would like to emphasize again to Dr. Azar and Edek, perhaps you need to, yeah, uh, you know, uh, come up with a talk on this, maybe a workshop, huh? training session, perhaps. Okay, a few more minutes, yeah. Uh, the ideal way to develop the career at an early stage. Uh, you can see this, okay, for early career researchers uh, that are more prominent in the study. They are very strategic uh, in funding opportunities, training opportunities, okay. They enhance their development. Uh, yeah, they, they, they reflect on their own research skills. Um, they always go for opportunities uh, to to go for uh, you know uh, online training during the pandemic. Uh, some of them say that nearly every other day uh, they attend uh, online a seminar, for example, to develop their skills in various uh, topics, uh, not necessary uh, in their research uh, area. Okay. All right, but anyhow, one thing that uh, we do not see in the uh, in the research that much for Malaysian ECRs is that uh, perhaps during the pandemic uh, they do not have access to mentors apart from their own previous uh, supervisor or PhD supervisor. Yeah, they also do not that uh, they do not 
work hand in hand that much with their head of department or immediate superior. So they get a lot of support from their own peers. So this is something that perhaps more ideal uh, to develop the career at an early stage where where early career researchers they have access to uh to you know not have access they always have access but but perhaps they don't go to their head of department or their immediate superior to discuss things yeah okay so all right what i would like to uh put forward here is that uh, the universities must future proof their academic researchers yeah right so yeah you the universities, the faculty, or even uh, those of us, uh, among us perhaps here, who are doing mentoring to early career researchers. So we should help them give support, articulating a path for them to be more visionary, for example, okay, uh, involving uh, our own network, for example, if you're mentoring, all right? Uh, and also, uh, yeah, uh, perhaps there is a need for us to uh, to apply decision making criteria and continuing measuring progress reflected through the uh, to the scholarly communication behavior practices All right yeah uh, because um, uh, among us uh, i mean the the researchers in this uh, field uh, we we see that uh, we are doing things we are practicing things based on how we are being assessed all right but it should be the other way around <laughs> okay you assess us based on how we practice how we behave yeah but this again needs to be debated perhaps there are questions about this all right can be quite controversial as well okay so to future proof academic researchers universities have to engage faculty to support the development of early career researchers uh i believe the slide will be shared to everybody but what i would like to highlight here is that uh universities have to engage the faculty faculty means that yeah the faculty people at the faculty the the faculty management make time to listen to early, early career researchers especially find out what their strengths are what are their expectations okay share information with them if you have any um you know um uh uh information that you can share you can give them and provide uh you know guidance to them on on how they can further develop their career. For example, information on funding, for example, information on possible funding for early career researchers, uh, training for early career researchers, for example, share this information to them, all right? Uh, make them feel value, give them credit when they deserve and help them to grow, yeah? So basically this is the, the message, make time to listen, share information, make early career researchers feel valued, help them to grow. So I remember uh, one, one early career researchers told me that he was actually introduced only in WhatsApp because as early career researchers in a faculty, they, they are not immediate faculty member. Maybe maybe this is different from faculty to faculty, all right? But, uh, but, they, they, but they can always be invited to attend a faculty meeting, right? So uh, this is what they, they feel that perhaps there is a need for the faculty to make them feel value, invite them to faculty meeting for the first time when introduced to introduce them to faculties instead of just putting them putting them in the faculty's website and introduce them introduce the early researchers there <laughs> so this is what I, I, I you know the, the story when we when we we talk about uh, you know uh, making early career researchers uh, feel valued okay so for the university management and administrators, how you can uh, future-proof your academic researchers, again, provide guidance, be a role model, and again, take an interest in their needs. So it is actually summer, lah, huh? guidance, role model, and take an interest in their needs, all right? You don't have to talk to them. The faculty will, will be able to do that. But uh, what you need to do is make sure that you have an interest in their needs, okay? All right, find out whether they are they have they, they have good working conditions, where are they now, okay? What are the contributions that they make? Talk to them, right? Okay, so, all right, I would like to extract this. Uh, I, I do believe that these are the things that uh, all of us uh, have in mind, all right? We, we understand that this is these are the ideals, but this can be done. Okay. Being future ready, ECRs means uh, that uh, you need to have a growth mindset. 
it's not just ECR, it's for everybody, isn't it? You need to have a growth mindset, mindset that allows you to think uh, and dream big. Now, I suddenly, I, I, I think this is something that Prof Awang, eh? Datuk Awang, see, always say that you have to think and dream big. Betul tak, Dr. Aza? Dr. Aza, Prof Awang always say this to ADAC staff, kan? And dream, eh? think yeah. and dream big, right? Okay, yeah. so doing something completely outside your comfort zone. Embrace your mistakes and move on. Some of the early researchers, because they, 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 they do, at first they did not have anybody to confide in. They did make mistakes, okay? And then, uh, yeah, they, they realize their mistake. They, they know what their mistakes are, yeah? And they, they just say that they have to move on, right? But they need to talk to somebody. That's what one researcher told me. Okay, and also uh, being future ready, means that you need to acknowledge and you need to celebrate other people's success as well. Yeah, okay. Having an endless supply of curiosity. Early career researchers, all researchers should never, never stop learning. All right. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I, I told my, my uh, colleagues just now, uh, I, I need to learn on how to, you know, to I need to learn on how to use ChatGPT uh, and, and make sure that what I don't like about ChatGPT uh, is being rectified. <laughs> okay, so this is something as, as a researcher, as an academic, you, you need to have, you need to also have this thirst okay, of, of, you know, lifelong learning should never, never stop with you. All right. Uh, believe you have enough opportunities to achieve success in life. Believe you can always do it. And finally, early career researchers did highlight this to me that it is not just about work. Okay, you need to be to have a balanced life. You your your you ne you need to have a healthy mind. We need to be uh to be healthy. Okay, we need to have a work life balance. Right. So this is what I I really see a difference between between early career researchers when they say that they also jog, they also go to gym, okay, uh, they go out during weekends, bring their children, all that. But but this is something that are needed by these young people, right, to keep their energy high. Okay. So this is to me this is something that perhaps we can reflect as a priority of action. It is not just about. Um, uh, uh, cognitive side yeah? this is not just about cognitive KPI and all that but to achieve that okay, you need to have this a growth mindset a lifelong learning a belief that you have enough opportunities and go for that opportunities ask for that, talk to people and also have um, a, a healthy mind Okay, so, uh, all right. In relation to that, uh, these are the things that I would like to highlight. These are actually coming from uh, International Science um, uh, ISC, okay, International Science Council, uh, that uh, this, uh, the international scientific community have been talking about the options for reform okay, in research. And this is what I could see being normalized now. Okay, the one that that I, I indicate as exclamation mark, eh? normalize. Normalize rapid communication to disciplinary peers through preprint servers. Okay. The, the message now is that for scientists to normalize preprint, not to get their publication research output fast, very fast to other research community by sharing it through preprint servers first. Okay. Then go to publishing. All right, and also innovative approaches to peer review and quality control. Start to take part in open peer review. When you, uh, when you see a paper on a preprint server that is uh, of your interest, go and take that, that opportunity to peer review it. Take that opportunity to peer review it, rather than you have a paper being you know sent to you to your email uh, from a journal general editor asking you to review. Okay, take part in this innovative approaches to uh, open peer review, right? And also to normalize sharing of uh, data in line with the FAIR principles, okay? So you submit a paper to, uh, to a journal and at the same time, all your 
supplementary materials and data, uh, you uh, share it somewhere else in a repository. So these are the things that uh, are, uh, uh, the, the ISC uh, has called for researchers to normalize, normalize preprint server, open peer review, and also sharing of research data. Uh, uh, the development and implement and governance come to the level of the university and also uh, the uh, the policy makers. Yeah? But I would like to stress options for reform in the context of, of researchers. There are three of them that should be normalized. Okay, we, we, we have to do this. I, I advise early career researchers to do this. Jangan sampai macam dah apa, kena mandate baru buat. Don't, don't. All right? Okay. Okay, so this align with the principle for scientific, scientific publishing to open the record of science, all right? The scientific community is all out, uh, advocate for uh, researchers to start opening their record of science. So make yourself transparent, make sure that you have an ORCID ID, um, make sure that uh, publications that come to your ORCID ID or Pablon, for example, are really you. Okay, make sure that you have all this evidence-based uh, uh, information, yeah? Okay, and uh, as uh, a committee member of the International Science Council for the Future of Scientific Publishing, uh, these are the publications that uh, the committee have uh, published. Uh, these are all available online full text. Please take a look at them. Yeah, uh, uh, and I have also asked the library to disseminate these to faculties. Uh, talk about opening the record of science about the business model for scholarly communication if you are in general editor or publisher perhaps there is a you know need for you to look at this as well and also on strengthening research integrity there are more uh, publications that are coming uh, uh, that have not been published for last years and more coming for, for this year and the recent one is on a uh, peer review okay it seems that a uh, peer review has been broken. Some, some offers say that the peer review has been broken. There are so many papers uh, that are going out for peer review, but uh, the peer reviewer, the scholarly community are not taking it up. And what, what is the reason? Are we too busy to do peer review, for example, right? And in the case of early career researchers, they say that, oh, why must I do it? It is not our KPI. Okay, so what, what is it? What, what are we doing now as a scholarly communication committee? We, we have things, we have responsibilities towards one another. And yeah, okay, a paper on peer, uh, 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 a publication on peer review is coming out from uh, ISC. Okay, so lastly, I would like to just, uh, you know, bring you to, to reflect if you're early career researchers or even if you are just, we are all researchers, yeah, academic researchers. What, or are you making a contribution to academic research? Are you making a contribution? What is it? How does you know? How does one know that you are making contribution? This is very airy fairy, just reflection. You can ask yourself how to answer this. Could you do more to make your contribution better? In your field, perhaps? Okay, in the general scholarly communication community? How could you do more to make your contribution better? Are you going to change things? Are you going to Okay, let's say if you advocate the diamond journals, how, how are you going to bring this up to the faculty? How are you going to change things to make your diamond journals being, uh, you know, uh, being uh, recognized, for example, for research assessment? Or will you just simply end up doing the line? All right. So these are the questions that perhaps you can reflect and the various voices that I shared just now uh, for further discussions, perhaps. Okay. So early career researchers, they are an investment in the future of research. Believe this, and finally, um, yeah, being future ready means you are being proactive and you are creating a better future. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to all of you here. I've exceeded 23 minutes, so we have only about 30 minutes for QA. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Aza. Over to you. Thank you so much, Prof. Abiza. That was wonderful. It's really an eye opening um, insight challenging the norm that we are should i say trapped in <laughs> the kpi <laughs> it's it 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 shows from your research that that the culture is in malaysia especially is very much kpi oriented yeah. so i think it's not just for the early career researchers it's for most of us why should we do it if it's not in our kpi maybe because there's so many to achieve and 
economic of course you 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 tend to prioritize what you have to do rather than what you would like to do and yeah um i would like to thank you so much uh, i would like to go to the question before we um uh take it further uh we have from dr rashid i think prof thanks for sharing i really appreciate it these are my questions is there any follow-up for this study i guess the answer is no is there any follow-up for this study for now uh, uh, as the follow-up we, we are going to have a survey that, that's a survey actually okay. survey for worldwide Nah, yeah. So we but look forward result, to that yeah. survey. Yes, uh, that is a survey. We want to confirm. <laughs> we, we just want uh, to confirm some hypothetical statement. I see. Uh, I see. So that is a survey worldwide, uh, but uh, it is still in in press. It it has not been as uh, yeah. It is it is still in press. Yes. Okay. That's and a survey. Another question from Dr. Rashid is: Can you mention again the name of the highly recognized preprint just now? Thank you. Ah, uh, okay. All right. So for uh, for Rashid, what what my uh, my suggestion my suggestion is you go to Scopus, okay. So in Scopus there are preprints that have been indexed. Ah, ah preprint servers that have been indexed. Some of these preprints, I, I believe some of you know these preprints in your discipline. For example, in physics, maths, computer science, is archive.org, bio archive. Chem archive because these are the disciplines that are using preprints. Mm. Ah, so in social sciences, tak ramai lagi yang guna. Jadi yang ada pun tak banyak lah. Mm -hmm. So this is you. You have to build your your community, your your research community. You know, you have to strengthen your research community. Okay, so if you have, if let's say your research community is into preprint, you come together and develop the preprints like archive.org. Archive.org is a wonderful, wonderful preprint service. Yeah, mm -hmm. physics can, huh? you're using this, right? But now preprints there are being indexed by Scopus. Mm -hmm. You can see the merit there, right? Preprints are being indexed. Uh, but yeah, we have not recognized preprint. Yes, I think we need uh, a session just talking about preprint. I think there's a lot of <laughs> questions going around. Um, yeah, I do get questions. Uh, outside from this webinar as well about preprints. So I think it justifies another another special slot on preprints only. <laughs> okay, we have another question from Dr. Norliana Kamarudin. Thank you, Prof, for sharing. My question is, when the interviewed subject mentions that there is near breakdown in the peer review system, do they mention what they do to get around this issue? Okay. Uh, uh, the, the issue was that... Um, some of them feel that uh, papers that are of no, you know, that does not reach the, the standard or the quality are also being published. You see? Okay. So, uh, and also about uh, the time taken for review. Yeah, the time taken for review. And sometimes the time taken given to the to reviewer, which is only two weeks. Do you see all this in for period, right? Kadang -kadang dua minggu je dia bagi kita, tak? That, that's it, right? Okay, thank you and all that. So there are reasons behind this, but these are the issues. This, but the but the breakdown is actually about the peer review system. Yeah, uh, uh, um, people who are not, uh, you know, authoritative enough, or the dis the the paper is not within his or her research discipline is getting that paper to be peer reviewed. You. But some people, they do this, they do peer review because they want to get uh, recognition in Pablon. Right? Yeah? So every time you, you, you get a paper and then you preview and yet whether you reject or you accept, you get that recognition in Pablon. Right? Mm -hmm. So these are the things that they mention to us. Okay? Sometimes they, they uh, but, but one thing is that um, people are not, the seniors are not willing to peer review it. Okay, and for early career researchers, they would like to peer review, but they do not get that request to peer review because they are not the corresponding author. Dr. Azza, normally when, when you get a paper to be peer reviewed, you are the principal author. Betul tak? Yes, right? I, I, ah. I, I realise that too. When yeah. when it's a journal that I submitted as a corresponding author, then I'll get yes. 
You submit and then two, 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 three days lepas tu, you will get a paper to be peer reviewed, right? Yes. So, yeah. when, uh, so that's it. Th these are the issues that they highlighted because it's not easy for them to be a corresponding author. At, yeah, they have to bargain lah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh -huh. They have to negotiate with the team, especially for those of them who are in the, uh, in the research group. And for, for, for those uh, postdoc or even for the PhD students, uh, the corresponding author will only go, all, always go to the supervisor. Mm. Yes. So uh, they would like to develop a good CV very much earlier mm. with them the corresponding author. Yeah. yeah. One way to do it, I suggest, or maybe Prof can suggest for the senior ones is to, to allow the younger ones to become corresponding author with with prior notice so that they know what's expected so not just you know um yeah. like a, so there's 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 a task and responsibility behind yeah. being yeah. a corresponding author and we provide that chance to them yeah. to become the corresponding author so that they earn it and you know yes. yeah it's not just like okay it's a deal you yeah. know <laughs> like a transaction <laughs> mm. okay i do um i would like to read prof mary from uh, from from law, dear Professor Abriza and Professor Noaza, this has been an eye opener session, and I think we need to assess law ECRs too. There you go, Prof. Someone, um, maybe one party to to replicate the research into. We'll yes. inform my dean. I have another meeting at eleven thirty, so she has to leave. But yeah, that's that's a very kind word, and uh, we appreciate that. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Any more questions? Orally, you would, would like to switch on your microphone, maybe? But anyone can replicate this. All the materials are there. Our interview <laughs> protocol, yes. Our coding sheet, yep. Mm -hmm. so, for, for, um, a discipline, for a discipline. Yes, I think this um, this session is useful because it's, yes, we have a question from Dr. Fong. Silakan, Dr. Fong. Hi, Prof. Thank you for the sharing. Um, I attended this session really just to get um, an idea of what is expected of early career researchers. So you mentioned about the role of mentors being um, very important in shaping the early career researchers, but not all supervisors are good mentors. And not all early career researchers are lucky enough you know, to have access to very good mentors to help them shape not only their, their character, but also to help them build their career career progress. So, what is your opinion? You know, in in terms of um, shaping mentors to lead earlier career researchers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fong, for the question. Actually, I can match whatever you said with an two three verbal themes similar that similar voice <laughs> about you know not all supervisors can be mentors. Okay. All right. Um, well, th this is something perhaps uh, Dr. Azza also can answer, can? You do have that mentoring program below, isn't it? Why, why are not we having it for <laughs> mentoring? Why, yes. why, don't, why do we stop? I think it just doesn't naturally progress. So it's slowly, you know, um, it, it turns back, it, it, it's passed back to the faculty to do the mm. mentoring. Mentoring. Um, because centralized, in, in a centralized manner, it's not so natural to do. Yes, yes. So we pass it back to the faculty and then, you know, um, when it gets to the faculty, it depends on who is in charge of coordinating, things like that. Some, some faculties, they do have this, uh, mm. uh, you know, um, sort of unofficial mentoring system. Yeah, uh, medic faculty, yes, medic adult, I know, because they need, a, like, uh, an early career academic must have a supervisor. It's not really a mentor, la, like a supervisor, yeah, okay, who is responsible for the career of, career development of the, of the, of the researcher. Okay, uh, well, um, I, I don't have specific suggestions for that, but um, this is what I can share. Not all early career researchers uh, are comfortable with mentor. Some of them, they feel that they need mentor, but many of them say that they just need the institutional support and they rely, they, they really have their own peers to support them. 
Mm. You see? So for mentoring, those who uh, those who have mentors are mentors that the university um, uh, uh, provide for them. Okay, for example, academic mentor, academic mentor. Uh, naturally, head of head of department should be an academic mentor. But for teaching, some uh, a few a few early career researchers from another university, not UM, said that. Uh, their university has this system where a young researcher okay, has an academic mentor that also go to your class okay, and observe how you teach. Uh, okay, the, the mentoring is different, but, but in the context of this, it's about research mentoring. Lah. For research mentoring, you definitely will be meant, not really officially mentored, but can can get that mentoring you have to you know you can go to your uh, uh, the principal investigator uh, the lab or the research group director for example okay but uh, dr fall i always say that the uh, you 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 can just approach somebody you, you don't have to say that i would like you to men mentor me and all that but you can always watch somebody from far <laughs> and get that person as you know maybe you have some a few people that, that you feel can be a role model to you right okay you can watch that person from far and get that opportunity to connect with these people okay you can talk to your dekan upamanya <laughs> okay Fong is with Fong with is the institute of advanced studies no i mean you can just be yeah just be open about it right uh -huh. You would like to connect to somebody, let's say, okay, uh, to this particular person, okay, and since you have this connection with the TNCA or T TNCPNI, for example, all right, you can, yes, you can, you can, uh, yeah, suggest that and get that connection through uh, your, your, your immediate, what I say, line manager, la. in your case, your immediate line manager will be the deputy dean or the dean, yes. The, the the head of department can yes i believe uh even even the the uh the administ the the you know academic managers eh, the deans the deputy deans they will be happy to help out isn't it betul tak betul tak if somebody approach you right yeah uh, definitely yeah. you they are, yeah. they are in that position because they can give support that's why they are there mm -mm. Mm. then it becomes more natural yes yeah, if it's match made, you know, sometimes the match doesn't, is not made in heaven, so <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, and that's also uh, Prof's point on being, uh, point number A, being proactive. So, yes. yeah, I, I, people on position, usually they are more open to accepting. Yes, that's why they are there. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's why you're there, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Not paid advertisement. My dekan very supportive. <laughs> okay. Because you you need to be future ready. You need to be proactive. You are because you want to create a better future for you, right? Mm -mm. So you, yeah. Okay. So if there's okay. no other questions, if there's no other questions, maybe we can conclude the session. Um. Um. Uh, I would like to thank Prof Abriza again for um showing us a window of the future of how it can be so now maybe we are bogged down by what is in front of us so we don't really we are not really able to see the future but from your research with the harbinger group um and your sharing today we are able to see what what the future may look like and how it is in other countries around the world so we don't feel so alone anymore um i maybe would like to also mention that uh, the young audience here, you are our future deans and decision makers of the university. So um, having this session today hopefully being, um, gives you some insight that when, when your time comes to lead and make decisions, you'll remember Dr. Prof. Abriza and Dr. Azar's session today that, yeah, this is not new, you know, things are not new and we can make that change in it's it's you it's needed because you see things are happening all around the world that um you know to the negative effect and to the positive effect so hopefully this uh, session will be a, a memorable one for many of us inshallah thank you so much again prof abriza and thank you everyone for joining assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh happy friday everybody and have a good weekend tomorrow <laughs>